Major funding for NJTV News is provided in part by RWJ Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years. And Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. Tonight on NJTV News, Phil Murphy pushes his key budget priority. Governor Murphy promises to ramp up political pressure on lawmakers who don't support his millionaire's tax and says a government shutdown remains an option. The report on the state's tax incentive program is out. What does it say and what does it mean for New Jersey business? Crime has dropped over 70% in Jersey City over the past two years, and now the mayor is praising its expanding police presence. A food incubator is helping companies go from concept to commercialization, and it's all part of Rutgers University. Plus, a way to curb overdose deaths, pass out free naloxone, no questions asked. Those stories are more next on NJTV News. <laughs> from the Agnes Barris NJTV studio at 2 Gateway Center in Newark. This is NJTV News with Mary Alice Williams. Hello, thank you for joining us on air and online. With the state budget in the balance, the state's governor marshaled his forces in a fight with legislative leaders over imposing a millionaire's tax. Senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan reports. Flanked by union bosses from across New Jersey, Governor Phil Murphy promised a reckoning as he berated Democrats in the legislature for introducing their own budget, one that lacks the millionaire's tax Murphy claims is crucial for fiscal stability, even as the clock ticks down to the June 30th budget deadline. I didn't get elected to come here to rush, rush, rush to June 30th and then wake up on July 1st and, uh, and start the whole cycle again. This ridiculousness of living from one day or one year to the next of wash, rinse, dry, repeat, uh, enough. And that's another reason why the millionaire's tax allows us to get to a better and stronger place. And I'm hopeful that over the next 10 days, they'll come to their senses, they'll break out of the Trenton bubble, and they'll stand with the governor just like we are right here and fight for the working people and the middle class in New Jersey. We will be at your office tomorrow. We will be on the phones each and every day urging you to do the right thing. But it seemed almost an empty threat for this budget cycle. Like last year, the State House has two proposed opposed state budgets. Speaker Craig Coughlin and Senate President Steve Sweeney have said they will not post Murphy's version or his millionaire's tax. The governor's cranking up public pressure, but seem to acknowledge the budget deadline may pass without a millionaire's tax. So to every legislator willing to kick the can down the road, Instead of picking it up and doing what's needed right now, I want to be perfectly clear. The pressure to pass a millionaire's tax will intensify and not lessen if it is not included in this budget. The Democrats balance their $38.7 billion budget with some one-shot revenues like a bigger than predicted corporate business tax haul. It's got no rainy day fund. That's the kind of budget tactic advocacy groups like New Jersey Policy Perspective deplore. New Jersey's in no position to fund the most important assets that make New Jersey great. We can't do this anymore where we're just year after year playing whack-a-mole. But the governor's political capital is thin. He was recently forced to re-sign the dark money bill he'd originally vetoed in order to avoid an embarrassing override. And while the governor today said he's got support in the legislature, he wouldn't name names. The headbutting contest exasperates millionaires tax advocates. A soap opera cat fight mudslinging between two characters in a story. It's not Murphy versus Sweeney or Murphy versus Norcross. The whose side you're on is about the many and the people and smart policy and investing in the state and showing up for millionaires and protecting the very wealthy. Union leaders pointed out polls show more than 70% of New Jersey residents support a millionaire's tax, but there's no rally of support in the assembly, which is on the ballot this November in a low turnout election. A small group of very committed and organized folks can have an outsized impact. So people who really don't like taxes 
even if they are outvoted when you take a poll, and polls show the general public likes it, but the general public isn't going to show up and vote in November. The legislature is expected to send its version of the budget without the millionaire's tax to the governor on Thursday. Murphy says all options remain on the table, including government shutdown. At the governor's office in Trenton, I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJTV News. A bombshell report finds companies tied to South Jersey power broker George Norcross reaped about a billion dollars in EDA tax breaks by lying and subterfuge unchecked by state oversight. Senior correspondent David Cruz was at the courthouse when a state superior court judge refused to block his release. After their name has been besmirched, after they've been maligned, you can sometime later on write some affidavit, maybe a month, two months from now, and we'll consider it. Despite impassioned arguments from Michael Critchley and other high-profile attorneys, the argument that the governor's EDA task force was doing reputational harm to South Jersey power broker George Norcross and the companies with which he's affiliated was rejected in court yesterday. Within minutes of the ruling, the report Norcross and company wanted to stop was in inboxes across the state, and the result will likely be more reputational harm. Special interests, which prioritize benefits to private parties rather than the state, had a significant impact on statutes and regulations, says the report. Perhaps most damning, this email from an executive at Camden-based Cooper University Hospital, where George Norcross is chairman, to a real estate broker allegedly asking for a sham inquiry. As part of our EDA application, we need a term sheet for a potential location outside of New Jersey. I need a credible location, says the email. Can you get me a term sheet for 120,000 square feet quietly? No probability of us moving to Center Square, so I don't want to make too much noise. Moving employees out of the state was a threat the company used to secure some $40 million in tax breaks. The EDA spends hundreds of millions of dollars of the people's money, and the people of New Jersey have a right to know whether that program has been administered in a fair fashion. Not right now, just in one second. Attorneys for Norcross and other plaintiffs in the case did not stop to talk to us after the judge rejected their quest for an injunction against the report. But the whole premise of their case is that the governor, through the task force, is attacking their clients and, by extension, the city of Camden. Not so, says the task force chairman. In these types of transactions, it is impossible we, in investigating the ED not to make reference and to look at the transactions of these applicants who got millions and millions of dollars worth of tax credits and tax incentives. It's possible that some of those tax incentive awards could be coming back, as much as half a billion dollars, according to the report. Murphy said today the fight over the EDA tax incentive programs was not over. This system cannot be allowed to continue for one day past June 30th. To do so would be to ignore both the facts presented by the task force and the facts presented by the communities left struggling in the shadows of the buildings this system built. Without the governor's okay, the tax incentives would sunset, leaving the state with no program. And the impact of that on New Jersey's business climate is anyone's guess. For NJTV News, I'm David Cruz. Last November, in response to a high-profile sexual assault claim, the state attorney general released new guidelines on handling assault cases. Well, today, lawmakers took up a package of bills aimed at strengthening the state's response to reports of sexual misconduct after an investigation found the Murphy administration fumbled the complaints of a state employee. Brianna Venosi reports. The entire 10-bill package sailed through the Assembly Appropriations Committee today with unanimous bipartisan support. It comes just weeks after the Legislative Select Oversight Committee investigation found Governor Phil Murphy's administration mishandled allegations of rape against a state employee within his gubernatorial transition team. At the end of the day, we wanted to prove that this wasn't a gotcha kind of committee. This was really a committee that we wanted to talk about what happened, right? But we 
wanted to come out of here um, with some solid uh, uh, legislation. The bill package includes a requirement for additional training for state employees who handle complaints of harassment or discrimination. It also creates a uniform way to keep written record of each account across all state agencies and builds a safeguard for prospective employees during gubernatorial transition. That's a gap the committee found during its investigation. It was clear that that was sort of a gray area in our policy and practice in New Jersey, but we know the campaigns are sort of ripe with this environment that sort of blurs the lines between what's appropriate. There's lots of after hour convenings, there's lots of alcohol involved, there's lots of loose reporting structures, and so fine tuning some of that in policy could really make a big impact. This is supposed to make it better for all of us, no matter who's in the administration, right? We want to make sure that employees are protected, women are protected, and men are protected. The committee formed after Murphy campaign staffer Katie Brennan took her allegations of rape against another member of the gubernatorial transition team public. Brennan said she was failed by the state in every attempt to report the misconduct. The bills mandate an equal employment opportunity and affirmative action officer to be staffed in every transition team moving forward. There were significant failures of leadership by this administration. Uh, and bordering on, I think, as our colleagues found, deliberate uh, kind of derelictions of duty. It's kind of sad that we have to legislate something that could have been handled very easily, in my opinion, um, as a former labor commissioner and on a transition team. But here we are, and um, I would be a yes vote on it. Other changes include a hotline for state workers to report workplace harassment and a requirement for any state employee applicant to disclose if they're under criminal investigation. And one final change, that's to the human resource management at the New Jersey Schools Development Authority. The bills now go for technical amendments before making their way to the Senate. It's unclear if Speaker Coughlin will post the bill package for vote before the summer break. At the State House, Brianna Venozzi, NJTV News. That cap on state and local tax deductions tops tonight's business news. Rhonda Schaffler is off today. Here's Joanna Gagas. Joanna. Mary Alice, the House Ways and Means Committee will hold a hearing next week to determine the impact of the SALT deduction cap on communities, schools, and housing values. New Jersey's U.S. Representative Bill Pascrell Jr., who sits on the committee, is praising the effort. He's long called for the removal of the caps on the state and local tax deduction, and he introduced a bill alongside Senator Bob Menendez in the Senate to repeal the caps entirely. Two bills moving through the state Senate and Assembly would create a joint commission between New Jersey and New York to improve transportation under the Hudson. Called the Gateway Development Commission, it creates a 50-50 split of all oversight and expenses for projects like the new Gateway Rail Tunnel, reconstruction of the Portal Bridge, and the repair of rail tunnels damaged by Superstorm Sandy. And those tunnels are in a race against time, said the bill's co-sponsor, Senator Tom Kane Jr. Newark is one of 10 U.S. cities participating in a pilot program to help all of its residents keep up with the city's growth. As economies grow, rent often rises and long-term tenants are forced out. So the city will focus on reducing eviction rates and providing access to free legal representation for residents. Data sharing with the other nine cities will also be a critical component of the pilot. It's run by Bloomberg Philanthropies, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and the Balmer Group. Newark was selected because of its existing commitment to addressing economic mobility. The country's largest drug maker, Pfizer Inc., is buying Array Biopharma for $10.6 billion. The acquisition will allow Pfizer to take ownership of Array's two colorectal cancer drugs that have had a good deal of success treating the disease. Pfizer said it wants to make colorectal cancer treatment a focus for the company. The markets neared all-time highs today, driven by optimism about a trade deal with China. The Dow climbed 353 points, the Nasdaq 108 points. And those are your top business stories. A legal victory for the city of Newark and a blow to its fraternal order of police. An appeals court has ruled its Civilian Complaint Review Board can conduct its own investigations of alleged police misconduct with full subpoena powers, reversing a lower court ruling that effectively stripped the board of its powers. Newark Mayor Raz Baraka today praised the ruling. Simply before the 40 immediate, we do it 
uh, because what we envision could take place uh, if we raise enough, uh, you know, power to be able to push it, what we need to push. And uh, this is an example of what we can do if we stick to it and be patient. While the appellate division largely sided with the city, it did uphold the public safety director's right to impose disciplinary action different from the one recommended by the board. Jersey City's expanding its police force to historic levels, inducting a new class of recruits that better reflects the population they'll serve, and is touting a stunning 70% drop in violent crime in just two years. But are our community members seeing a change? Raven Santana has the story. 50 new officers joined Jersey City's police department on Monday, expanding the city's ranks to 945 officers in total. In the 12 years that I served on the council and mayor, it's going to be 16 years at the end of this term, uh, this is the lowest rate of violent crime that I've ever seen. And uh, we're not going to stop till that is zero, but, uh, you know, we're, we're on track through uh, this year to have uh, the safest year on record and uh, our safety levels will rival any major city in the entire country. According to the city, data comparing the first six months of 2017 and 2019 show shootings are down 70 percent, 53 dropping to 16 and homicides dropped 75 percent. 12 down to 3. Yearly numbers show a decrease as well, although not as striking. From 2017 to 2018, shootings dropped from 103 to 74. Homicides were down from 20 to 15. I think the police officers have a great deal of credibility within the community because they're out there on a consistent basis, and uh, it's reflected the changes that we've seen in the numbers. But advocate Pamela Johnson says more cops doesn't mean less crime. We don't want to turn into a police city, you know, and I, and I think that we do have a, a you know, our, our police force has grown, right, definitely. But I don't think necessarily that prevents violence. Um, I think that working with the community and community organizations and, and getting kids at an early age, that's prevention. Usually when police are called, they're intervening in something that's, that has already happened. I don't know how much just the mere presence of police being president is going to, you know, diminish crime. In fact, we have had several shootings and homicide occur within maybe 100 or something feet from a police uh, paddy wagon or police car. Her feelings are shared by fellow advocate Frank Gilmore. While he does agree that crime has decreased, he's skeptical of the data. We got to understand how we use in a comparable variables. For instance, we might be talking about a six month period which seen predominantly winter months as opposed to a six month period which seen predominantly summer months. So of course the violence in the winter is going to be lower than the violence in the summertime. More people are outside in the summer. There's more daylight in the summer. So you just got to be very conscientious when you're looking at numbers and you're comparing the variables. We asked some Jersey City residents whether they think crime has dropped. Yeah, I think yes, like a lot of a little a little just a tiny bit. It has actually not been as bad as it's been in a while because it was bad in the last two, three years. While everyone I spoke to agrees that violence in the city has definitely slowed down, they also agree it's going to take more community involvement to reach Phillips' goal of eradicating violence altogether. In Jersey City, Raven Santana and JTV News. Patients at Greystone Park Psychiatric Hospital are at risk of imminent death or injury. That's according to a lawsuit filed against administrators and state health officials over policies that also put doctors and nurses in danger. NJ Spotlight's Lilo Staten has published a chilling report on the conditions there and the court's response. Lilo, what does this mean for the state and Greystone's residents? Well, it's a, it's a big deal. Um, for the state, it means that they need to uh, file paperwork in a week or, or show up in court um, within the month, basically, to defend how they've run the hospital. Um, and these allegations go back years. Um, the Murphy administration has invested a lot to try to improve things, but the question really is what has changed? And I think, I think the, 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 the scary part is that for patients, um, there are a lot of dangers that still exist there. Okay, thank you, Lilo. And you can sign up for their daily newsletter. Go to njspotlight.com and click on NJ Spotlight Newsletters. The 
application for a power plant in the Meadowlands that sparked such controversy has been yanked, if only temporarily. The natural gas-fired station would generate 1,200 megawatts of electricity to benefit New Yorkers, not New Jerseyans. Opponents calculated the new plant would emit some 2.5 million metric tons of carbon dioxide. The developer told the state it's considering changes to the plant's technology and would apply for a new air permit which regulates greenhouse gas emissions. New Jersey lost more than 3,000 people to overdoses last year. Today, the state is trying a new pilot program to combat the crisis, handing out 20,000 free twin packs of the overdose reversal drug naloxone at nearly 180 pharmacies across the state. The one-day giveaway paid, by the, paid for by the Murphy administration aims to put the life-saving drug in the hands of, other, of people other than emergency responders and to provide instructions on what to do after administering the drug. The key thing is to call 911. It is very important that we use this opportunity to save a life and then get the individual connected to medical care so that we can get them connected to treatment and on the path to recovery. Because our goal here is recovery. Turning now to a business incubator embedded deep in the farmlands of South Jersey, where entrepreneurs can go to build on an agricultural idea or grow their own. Leah Mishkin reports. So our product development kitchen, if clients come in and they say, okay, I've got an idea, or I have this, this prototype that I really want to make better, this is where it would start. To get to the Food Innovation Center at Rutgers University in South Jersey, you'll pass all kinds of farms. The center's founder, Peggy Brennan Tanetta, says over 20 years ago, there were even more farms, but research showed the agriculture industry and small-scale food manufacturing was on the decline. She says it was because of a housing boom and increased cost of doing business. On top of that, on the business level, companies were dealing with these sorts of problems. They also didn't have information on new types of technologies to increase efficiency. Um, they didn't understand how to really improve their business operations and changing food safety laws to be in compliance with uh, federal regulations. That's why the Food Innovation Center was founded in 98. It was a way for the state university to give food companies a place to get help from experts on all of the above to keep them here and to help them to grow and to create more jobs and to be more of an economic driver for the economy of New Jersey. The Food Innovation Center has expanded to two locations, one center in Piscataway and this building in Bridgeton, which houses a small-scale manufacturing plant. On uh, any given day, we could have clients who are uh, ideating new products. We can have clients who are in our product development lab developing prototypes of products, or we could have clients in the plant uh, actually producing commercial saleable product for distribution. They could test the market, they can sell it to retail, which makes us unique in the country. There is no other university-based food business incubator that manufactures product for retail sale. Chang's Pizza Cones was attracted to the incubator for that very reason. The founder and CEO says he came across the idea for his company on a trip to Italy about four years ago. He wanted to start a business to make pizza more convenient. With our recipe, you can actually eat around it and you can hold it upside down and there's really no mess and no drip. Between the two facilities, there are 20 to 35 clients on any given day. They range from startups and beverages to companies that are further along in the plant technology sector. Many people have heard about the Impossible Burger, which is a meatless based hamburger that looks, tastes, smells exactly like a hamburger. They're a California-based company. They were able to make their food product in their lab, but they had no idea how to manufacture it. They found the Food Innovation Center, sent their scientists over here, our food engineers and our product development people and food technicians work with them here to understand how to actually manufacture the burgers in larger scale. And so they launched their business here for two years, manufacturing the first Impossible Burgers for sale. Next year, the Food Innovation Center plans on launching the Rutgers Global Food Accelerator Program, which is designed to get companies to market more quickly. In Bridgeton, Leah Mishkin, NJTV News.
and now some noteworthy facts that help you know Jersey. The governor's task force recommends the state recapture $500 million in tax incentives that were already awarded. The first government shutdown in state history was in 2006. Newark's police department has been under federal oversight since 2016. And in 2007, the Food Innovation Center was named Incubator of the Year by the National Business Incubation Association. If there's someone who you'd like to get to know Jersey, share. Use hashtag no Jersey. Tomorrow on NJTV News, what will happen when a new aviation technology park brings the feuding governor and Senate president in close proximity? To share any story you've seen tonight, go to njtvnews.org. I'm Mary Alice Williams. For all the men and women of NJTV News, thank you for being here. We'll see you tomorrow. The members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. And PSE&G, we make things work for communities. Have some water. Sir. Look at these kids. How are you? What do you see? I see myself. I became an ESL teacher to give my students what I wanted when I came to this country. The opportunity to learn, to dream, to achieve a chance to belong and to be an American. My name is Julia Toriani Crompton and I'm proud to be an NJEA member.